So I'm grateful to be beginning a two-part series called Opening Doors. And today's message is Welcome In. And I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about the legend of the Buddhist bodhisattvas, who from a Western perspective are like angels. But the legend of the bodhisattva is that the bodhisattva gets right on the cusp of enlightenment, but doesn't become fully enlightened because the bodhisattva commits themselves to serving humanity and all of us becoming enlightened. Part of the bodhisattva vow is that all beings are numerous, but we vow to save them all. There's something very noble in that. It sounds futile at first, but it's very noble. And so uh, we might say that we know that suffering will never end, yet we vow to stop it. It's that, that nobility. And as I'll talk about, there's a kind of enlightenment in that as well. I have my own vow at Mile High Church when I started here is the Mile High names are numerless, but I vow to learn them all. <laughs> I'm still trying. But it's in the effort, right? The enlightenment is in the effort. And one of my favorite analogies of the Bodhisattva is that they hold the door of heaven open for everyone to walk through and will not step into heaven until everyone has passed. And when I was a teenager and I first heard that story, I thought, how noble, how powerful. And I wonder if I could ever be uh, someone like a bodhisattva just in the presence of, of opening the doors for others to walk into heaven. I'd love to dedicate my life to that. And now, you know, 15, 16 years in ministry, um, I've learned something really important. And that is that heaven isn't walking through the door. It's holding it, the door open. Enlightenment isn't walking through the door. It's holding the door open. It's embodying that spirit of welcome in. Welcome in. Welcome in. Welcome in. Welcome in to a deeper joy. Welcome in to sacred space. Welcome in to your own heart. Welcome in to love, prosperity, grace. There's no greater gift than we can give than to welcome in. Those of you who know me here on Sundays know that there's two spaces I most love to be. Uh, the first space is right here on this stage because of the incredible honor to attempt each uh, time I speak to take all the collective wisdom in this room and reflect it back to you. So I love being here. But the second place, and you'll, sometimes you'll see me there, is outside of the doors. I love welcoming people in because each and every one of us comes in uh, from a unique place. Some of you walked in this morning grieving your mom. Some of us worked, walked through in pain in some area of our life. Some of us walked through in complete joy and satisfaction. But welcome in, welcome in. There's great power in holding the door open, but what I would point out is that it's not our job to be like new age hall monitors. Um, <laughs> each of you is an open door. That wherever you encounter someone, you can be an opening that says, welcome in. Let your hair down. Just be yourself. Welcome in. Welcome in. Here is sacred space. Welcome in to stepping more deeply into who you are and to who you want to be. What does that mean for you to be an open, welcoming space that says, welcome in? In our teaching, we are more apt to consider something like heaven less as a place and more as a state of consciousness. And that would be true for enlightenment and nirvana as well. Seek not to enter into heaven, but seek to cultivate a little piece of heaven right where you are. Seek not to become enlightened, but seek to get a glimpse of enlightenment in this very moment. Seek not to achieve nirvana, but let nirvana be the byproduct of being as fully present as you can to the goodness 
that is here in this moment to appreciate and to devour. The great Kurt Vonnegut, the great novelist, was fond of talking about his uncle Alex, who was a very well-educated and humble man, but he would share, he was well-read and wise, and his principal complaint about other human beings was that they so seldom noticed it when they were happy. So when we were drinking lemonade under an apple tree in the summer, say, and talking lazily about this and that, almost buzzing like honeybees, Uncle Alex would suddenly interrupt the agreeable blather to exclaim, if this isn't nice, I don't know what is. So I do the same now, and so do my kids and grandkids. And I urge you to please notice when you are happy and exclaim or murmur or think at some point, if this isn't nice, nice. I don't know what is. And if it's true for you in this moment, let's say that together. If this isn't nice, I don't know what is. So good to be present in this moment. Seek not to become enlightened, but seek to practice an enlightened compassion. Seek not to become enlightened, but seek an enlightened kindness an enlightened appreciation. And this, by welcoming in just this, it will open incredible doors for you. I have one more bodhisattva story for you, uh, an image of one of these bodhisattvas coming up on our screens here. And as you can see, if you don't understand them, they can look a little scary. You know, this is Guillermo del Toro, the film director would be proud. You know, I want to teach my daughter about bodhisattvas, but I probably wouldn't put that statue in her room. You know, it might, it might scare her. And yet when you understand, you see the immense symbolism and beauty. This particular bodhisattva started off as a monk and he did all his meditation work uh, and he realized that all things are impermanent and he practiced and understood the Four Noble Truths and followed the Eightfold Path and uh, with that found himself moving into this heavenly realm where complete nirvana would be uh, experienced and he, and he heard a small cry and he looked back there at the earth and there was someone who was suffering. And he, in that moment, decided to delay his enlightenment and went back and helped that person. And so he was given uh, the role of bodhisattva and given a hundred hands with an eyeball in each hand to help spot and support those who are suffering in the world. And the message is a simple but profound one to me, and that is, don't ever let there be a choice between heaven and helping others. Don't for you ever let there be a choice between enlightenment and compassion. Because heaven is helping others. Because enlightenment is our ability to cultivate compassion right here and right now and to bring it to others. Jesus, in talking about the kingdom of heaven, said that the kingdom of heaven is like a shepherd who had a hundred sheep and lost one. What should he do? Well, all common sense says, well, let the one sheep go and carry on with your 99. Don't risk losing another. But heaven's way, God's way, doesn't always make common sense. Jesus says that the um, shepherd will do everything he can to welcome that sheep back in. And you and I, we have a choice as powerful spiritual beings. At all times, you are welcoming in. Every day, you are welcoming in. Just think about what have you welcomed in to your consciousness just this morning? Has it been good for you? Has it been not so good? On the welcome mat of your heart, does it say, no trespassing, keep out? Does it say, welcome in? And here's such an important understanding about our teachings on affirmative prayer, is that unless we can see everyone as worthy of heaven and worthy of the highest good, we cannot enter ourselves. Whatever you choose to welcome into your consciousness opens a door for you. And it's up to you on where that door leads based upon what you welcome in. What am I welcoming in? Peace, 
love, prosperity, unity, forgiveness, healing. Welcome it into your heart and watch as doors are opened to you to practice that enlightened version of that virtue to demonstrate new possibilities. If you're feeling stuck on the pathway of your life, there is a door available to you waiting for you to welcome in that spirit you seek to demonstrate in your life. One of the secrets of our form of prayer is that we are often seeking to embody that which we seek at a later time right here and right now. I have a difficult, challenging conversation upcoming. I'm going to embody right now the courage and the honesty needed for that. I'm seeking to build or create a new relationship. I'm going to seek to embody the willingness to love right here and right now. It gets tricky because if you want to get an A on an exam, you can't just embody the A, but you can embody all the wisdom and intelligence that is needed for you to demonstrate that. So think about that. What are you calling to welcome in, to embody, to open the doors that take your life to a new level of possibility, a new level of creation and understanding? As we talk about opening doors for others, it's Mother's Day, and it's a wonderful time to acknowledge those who have opened doors for us particularly the incredible women in our life. And if you were to ask me what the secret of my success is, and no one ever has, but if you did, <laughs> I, would, I would tell you that I'm just so damn supported. It's, 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 it's magical to me, the amount of people that I've attracted in my life who've given me incredible support, especially on my path of ministry. And I've had a couple male mentors in my life, but the majority have been incredible women. I'm so grateful to my mom who taught me the importance of, of kindness and diplomacy with others. I'm so grateful for uh, Mary Feldman, who I know is watching me online right now, who when I was 14 uh, asked me if I wanted to take a class. Uh, this is in 1995 at the Huntington Beach Church of Religious Science where Dr. Roger had been. Uh, and I said yes, and she won, made sure that they knew that a teen could take the class and let them know that I wasn't going to pay for it because I didn't have the money so I could set up the chairs and make the coffee and that was how it's going to be. Uh, and here I am 41 years old in 2022 thanks to, to Mary opening that door for me uh, in 1995. And I could go on and on, and I didn't really understand till I was older, because many of the women who were opening doors for me were, were elders, that, that they were opening doors for me that in many instances were not available to them when they were my age. What a noble and powerful thing that these women took time to see who I was, even before I could see it about myself, and nurture me and uplift me into who I could be. What an important legacy for all of the female figures in our lives to keep opening the doors for everyone, but especially for women to continue to step into the boldness and the greatness of who they can be and the leadership that is needed in our homes and in our churches and in our communities and in our country and in our world. Maria Tatar uh, wrote, go ahead, yeah, sure. <laughs> Don't get too many amens in a religious science church, but that works for me. Maria Tatar, she's an incredible woman. She's a professor of folklore and other things at Harvard, and she writes these incredible annotated uh, uh, works, and she just uh, put out a book called uh, The Heroine with a Thousand and One Faces. And that may sound familiar because it's taken or inspired by Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which talks about the male hero uh, in everyone and how it moves forward. Well, she focuses this book on the women and all of the incredible stories. And most importantly to me, uh, the emerging myths of what femininity can bring to our world in more incredible ways. She says that she hopes her book will reveal the value of remaining open and curious about who inhabits our world and also standing up and using our voices even when those who came before us were silenced. With women now better represented in the workplace, 
as doctors, pilots, firefighters, preachers, and judges, it is almost impossible to mourn the world we have lost. Women now provide models, imaginary and real, in abundance, changing the myths we live by and remaking the human world in ways that promise to make the world more humane. And it reminds me that we probably don't just need a mother's day, we probably need a mother's decade, right? A mother's century. And this is part of that important aspect of embracing the divine feminine in our teaching because it's not about um, separating it from the masculine one. It's about bringing things together into wholeness so that we can lead ourselves and one another. We continue to live in a world where you look across the world and you still see so many women subjugated from, from education. You see trafficking even in our own country. If you read a newspaper or online, uh, wherever it is, even this week, you can see so many things that speak to women's issues. Women who are right here in our church today uh, feeling ill or uneasy, uh, unsure about their own upcoming health concerns, taking care of themselves and their families in their life. And I don't mean to get into the complicated issue of abortion, and people can see that in all sorts of ways, but I think we can empathize incredibly with women who are unsure about what they may be allowed to do or not do with their bodies. What a difficult place to be. It's, and it speaks to the importance uh, in our lives of, of continuing to make sure that all of us are opening the doors for girls and for boys to embody all of those aspects of themselves that allow them to be the dynamic people they were meant to be and to help lead our communities, our country, and our world in a more respectful, heart-led direction. Uh, Tatar, she tells lots of stories, but again, she, she talks about how the female voice has been perhaps subjugated, and we use these terms like old wife's tales, fairy tales, she even points out that, that gossip, sometimes something that I greatly criticize, was a really important form of communication for sometimes protecting women and others from things that were going on. And so many of these stories of the female myth, my daughter watches them all the time and Frozen and uh, all of these things are, are so alive for us to embody and live from a greater degree. Uh, and she quotes one of my favorite um, authors, Ursula Le Guin, uh, who was speaking at a commencement address, and she said this. Um, she spoke to the graduates about different language registers, a father tongue that is the voice of power and reason, and a mother tongue that is the voice of stories, conversation, and relationships. In this ideological dichotomy, the mother tongue is devalued as inaccurate, unclear, coarse, limited, trivial, banal. It's repetitive, she added, the same over and over like the work called women's work. Le Guin urges women to raise their voices in a third language of song, poetry, and literature, saying, I am sick of the silence of women. I want to hear you speaking. There's a lot of things I want to hear you talk about. And so I just invite us to take a moment just to quietly say aloud the names of mothers or important female influences on your life that have opened doors for you. Thank you for that. There's one more piece that I want to share with you this morning, and it's, uh, it was originally kind of an epic poem by a great minister of the last century named Sam Shoemaker. And you'll see how it fits in because the poem is called I Stand by the Door, and obviously I'm not going to read it you for an hour, but I will touch upon a couple pieces here. He says, I stand by the door. I neither go too far in nor stay too far out. The door is the most important door in the world. It is the door through which people walk when they find God. There is no use my going way inside and staying there when so many are still outside and they, as much as I, crave to know where the door is. They creep along the wall like blind men with outstretched groping hands feeling for a door, knowing there must be a door, yet they never find it. So I stand by the door. 
the most important thing that anyone can do is to take hold of one of those blind, groping hands and put it on the latch. The latch that only clicks and opens to the person's own touch. And it speaks, one, to this important point that you can't force people through the door, right? It's welcome in, not get your butt in here, right? (laughs) We can be a loving presence. We can be an available presence, but we have to let people find their way. Sam Shoemaker was an important part of something that used to exist called the Oxford Group. It was a a group that was very progressively Christian, a very powerful group. And what sprang out of that, and you can see the essence in the poem a little bit, was Alcoholics Anonymous. Something very important to many people here who are in recovery that's all about creating a community for people who are experiencing addiction to do two things. One, to have the door open for them whenever they are suffering, whenever they are sorrowful, whenever they are taken over by their addiction to come in. And yet it also creates the the opportunity for those experiencing addiction to open the door for others. And that for me is what has made it so successful for so many countless people. It's a safe space ideally to enter and it's a safe space to be of service, to always open the door. And it leaves us with the understanding of where in our lives are we opening doors and where within ourselves are we keeping doors shut? Is there anyone in our life that we've shut a door to that perhaps with stronger boundaries we might open up again to know something better they are capable of, that something more they can heal? That again, that aspect of recognizing that if we want to be in a heavenly state, we can't leave anyone out of it. Shoemaker continues, he says, I admire the people who go way in, but I wish they would not forget how it was before they got in. You can go in too deeply and stay in too long and forget the people outside the door. As for me, I shall take my old accustomed place, near enough to God to hear him and know he is there, but not so far from people as to not hear them, and remember they are there too. Where? Outside the door. Thousands of them, millions of them, but most important for me, one of them, two of them, ten of them, whose hands I am intended to put on the latch. So I shall stand by the door and wait for those who seek it. I'd rather be a doorkeeper, so I stand by the door. There's a divine contradiction, a divine dichotomy, and it is that you are never separate from God, and yet every opportunity, every moment, is an opportunity to draw nearer to her. You are never separated from divine spirit or divine love. And yet every moment is an opportunity to get closer. But it is up to each of us to welcome that in. And the core or the heart of my message to you today is that by welcoming in that virtue that your heart has been longing for, that a door will be opened for you that will lead you to that next adventure, that next right relationship, that deeper understanding, that higher level of consciousness that your life demands that you see with in order to move forward, in order to move deeper, in order to help create harmony and a better life for those around you. So I invite you to join me in prayer if you so choose. I invite our incredible prayer practitioners to stand if they'd like. And I acknowledge our online practitioners who are waiting right now for those watching online. If you go to the watch page and click the button, there'll be practitioners available to pray with you today as well. And I just begin this prayer by honoring the legacy of mom. What an indispensable word in that for each and every one of us, almost all of us, a different image, a different name comes to mind. That if hopefully inhabited, whether our biological mother or not, that presence of divine and unconditional love. And for those whose mothers are no longer here in physical form, I simply honor that ancestral bonding that recognizes that although our bodies do indeed come to an end, our relationships are forever, like it or not. 
We are divinely connected and we have that choice to always nurture those bonds wherein we can find new epiphanies, new understandings, and perhaps even intimate conversations that warm our heart and touch our souls. Honoring whatever it is that we are choosing to welcome in this day, I know that there are doors being opened, doors that lead to reconciliation, inner and outer, to forgiveness, to greater joy, to a greater way of living and being and thriving, to an immense appreciation that lays the foundation for a richer, more healthy, profound life. There is healing in this door. There is opportunity in this door. May we let go of anything that would keep us walking in through this passageway of newness to find that all too familiar divine presence awakening itself in us again, leading us forward step by step, heartbeat by heartbeat, moving us ever closer to an experience of the incredible divinity of who we are. We embrace it, let's become it, and let's be it right here and right now. And so it is. Thank you.